Hey everybody, this is chapter one of No Vons in the Crossfire. Um, the first part, there's, this book is kind of made of like two books. Um, the first book is, uh, the first part, which I guess would be like its own book, would be part one is titled In the Land of the Cracked Bell. And it says it's for Do, Oan, Da, and Helene. Um, I was going to say, uh, yeah, so that's, this, this is part one of the book. There's only two parts. The second part is titled, In the Land of Heloise. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Um, but the, uh, there's a little preface at the beginning of this section, but I'm just going to read that as part of chapter one in the sa for the sake of the recording. The preface is like a page or two long. I'm not going to record a separate video for that. That's too tedious. But I'm going to include it in this one. And this chapter is titled Arrest. But first, the preface. Preface. Quote, The only historians I trust are those who risk getting their throats cut. End quote. Pascal. Considering the present, quote, socialist, end quote, Republic of Vietnam and its official history, which is uncritically accepted virtually everywhere, I cannot read this maxim without a strong sense of how narrowly I managed to survive. In Vietnam, 1920 to 1945, Révolution et Contre-Révolution sur la domination coloniale, uh, that was uh, uh, Novan's, uh, like, more, like, objective historical work uh, book on uh, uh, anti-colonial uh, activity in Vietnam. I attempted to rescue that period from oblivion, a period that was marked not only by the struggle against colonial imperialism, but also by movements striving instinctively for an internationalist social revolution, movements that refused to subordinate themselves to the dictates of Stalinist Russia. In the present text, I'm going to speak as a direct witness of that period. Most of the others who took part in that struggle, if they were not massacred, imprisoned, or sent to the penal colonies by the French colonial regime or forced into exile, ended up being murdered by Ho Chi Minh's, quote, communist, end quote, party. Scarcely seven years had elapsed since the October 1917 revolution in Russia when I became fully aware of the oppressive reality of Indo-Chinese society and fully determined to revolt against it. For me, like so many others, the Russian Revolution was a hopeful sign of possible liberation, yet even then, during those early years of my apprenticeship in life and revolt, the rare news that reached us from Russia, Russia sometimes contained disturbing features. Oppositionist revolutionaries were being hunted down, and Trotsky had just been forced into exile. Through the Third International, Stalin was imposing a totalitarian policy that seemed to us to betray the internationalism integral to every revolutionary struggle. Under these circumstances, confronted with the emergence of a regime whose full horror became glaringly, glaringly evident with the Moscow trials, it was natural that our critique of Stalinism was initially oriented around the ideas and partisans of Trotsky. Since my departure from Indochina in 1948, if the hope and conviction of the necessity of overthrowing the despicable world order never left me, they were nourished by new reflections on Bolshevism and revolution. In France, I found new allies in the factories and elsewhere among French people, colonized people, and refugees from the Spanish Civil War of 1936 to 1939. Uh, there's a picture of uh, Novan with uh, Abel Paz, who wrote the big biography on uh, Buenaventura de Ruti, who's a uh, Spanish anarchist. Um, anarchist and pumistas who had gone through a parallel experience to ours. In Vietnam, as in Spain, we had been engaged in a simultaneous battle on two fronts against a reactionary power and against a Stalinist party struggling for power. These encounters, along with rereading Marx illuminated by the work of Maximilien Rubel, I have Maximilien Rubel uh, pieces on this channel, discovering the 1919 Workers' Councils in Bavaria and the 1921 Kronstadt Revolt in China, I mean, not in China, in Russia, I have uh, videos on the uh, Kronstadt Revolt on this channel.
Then seeing the resurgence of workers' councils in Hungary in 1956 led me to investigate new revolutionary perspectives and permanently distanced me from Bolshevism, Leninism, Trotskyism. I developed a total distrust of anything that might turn into a, quote, machine, end quote. The so-called, quote, workers' parties, end quote, Leninist parties in particular, embryonic forms of the state. Once in power, these parties form the nucleus of a new ruling class and bring about nothing more than a new system of exploitation. Quote, the existence of the state is inseparable from the existence of slavery, end quote. Marx. Orwell rightly noted that those who control the present control the past. When history adopts the discourse of the victors, concealing and dissolving all past struggles with a simplistic Manichaeanism that obscures what was truly at stake, the present reality seems inevitable and inescapable. The future of human societies thus depends on our capacity to wrest this past from the cold grip of the present masters. Voices have been lost. We must try to bring them back to life to rediscover the living traces of the relay of rebellion that traverses time to restore them and to pass them on. Okay, so that's the end of the preface. Chapter 1, Arrest. That afternoon, Wednesday the 10th of June, 1936, Lu San Han came to my workplace on the floor above the Discour and Cabal metal product store to discuss our call for a general strike and for forming action committees. I had hidden a red cotton banner above the shelves at the back of the store but had not yet finished painting the slogans in white. Around 5 o'clock, two Frenchmen suddenly appeared. Lu San Han recognized one of them, quote, the Suerte. End quote. If you don't know who the Suerte are, they're like the um, French colonial like police. I think more uh, serious than like uh, like I don't know, just beat cops. But I'm not sure. No, I'm pretty sure that's. It might be something similar similar to like the Akrana, um, or the Cheka, or the Gestapo, or something like that. If you're curious, um, the Suerte. He hissed and raced down the stairs four at a time, and raced down the stairs four at a time. Quote, put in your coat and follow me, end quote. One of the policemen snapped at me. Quote, we have a warrant for your arrest, end quote. I put on my jacket and descended the stairs, flanked by the two policemen. On the ground floor, the astonished stairs of workers, salesmen, and coolies followed us to the door. In their haste, the cops hadn't noticed the mimeographed copy of Class Struggle from America that I had been deciphering when work slacked off, which still lay on my desk. They pushed me into a tarp-covered truck parked about a hundred meters away at the Quai de Belgique. There I found Lu San Han, breathless and handcuffed. An Anamite cop had overtaken and tripped him as he ran away. Uh, Anam Anam is a uh, section of Vietnam. Um, so an Anamite would have been a cop from that particular section, Anam. They handcuffed me also and drove us to the Suerte headquarters at the upper end of Rue Catanat. On the way, I said to myself, quote, From this moment on, a page is turned in your life. There's no going back, end quote. The cops left Lu San Han at the police station and told me to take them to my home. I lived in Shamga, village of the Hens, in the northwest suburb of Saigon, but I pretended I was living with my mother some 15 kilometers from town. Three kilometers from Two Duck, the truck stopped at the side of the road from which there were only footpaths bordered by, bordered by woods. It was getting dark, and the four comps escorting me were on their guard, perhaps still haunted by the spectator, specters of the village police officials who had been murdered by peasants a few years earlier, in 1930 and 1931. Dogs barked as we passed near the straw huts, arousing the whole hamlet of Tan Lo. The two Anamite henchmen were posted behind the hedge, while posted behind the hedge, while the French inspectors searched the house in the presence of my mother. She was terrified, but didn't utter a sound. I was sick at heart to see her silent grief. My few books in French, carefully stored in the old cupboard, were tossed onto the camp bed. They left Rousseau, Plato, and Plutarch, but confiscated. Mustafa Kamal, Ul Orient, and Marsh and George Garros, Forceries Humane. 
After exploring the dark corners where the rice jars were kept and some clothes were hung on a line, they asked me where I kept my own clothes. I had no choice then but to take them to my real home in Shom Ga. It was completely dark by the time the truck stopped in front of my lodging. Having quickly grasped what was going on, Sung, my young fellow lodger, escaped by jumping over the back hedge. Vo Van, Vo Van Don was less agile and was captured by the cops. They discovered a mimeographed edition of our clandestine newsletter, Tian Dao, Vanguard, underneath the mat in my room and packed my entire library in a small truck to take away. I still remember the titles of some of the books, The Communist Manifesto, Trotsky's Permanent Revolution, Le Ri, Roubaud's Vietnam, La Tragedie Indochinois, Chin, Indochinois, John Reed's Ten Days That Shook the World, Ryazanov's biography of Marx, and a book on Sun Yat-sen. Personal papers including my crude attempts to translate remarks, All Quiet on the Western Front, and Silvio Pellico's My Prisons were also confiscated. My reading had been guided by the list of subversive books and pamphlets seized during raids on other militants which were naively published in newspapers. As for the Marxist texts, I had ordered them from Paris and they had escaped postal censorship. At the Suerte headquarters on Rue Catinat, my comrades and I were separated. I spent the night in the guard room, one ankle in shackles fastened by a rod to some other prisoners arrested for gambling. Thus attached, we lay crammed side by side on filthy wooden planks. The next evening, the examining magistrate charged my friends and me with subversive activities and placed us under a com committal order. As night fell, we were taken to the central prison where we had to surrender our tax cards, our shoes, our money, and anything else we had on us. Then we were taken back to the Suerte, each of us flanked by an animite cop to keep us from ta talking to each other. I was taken alone to a room on the top floor. Jello, a huge mixed-race cop with squinting pig eyes, said he'd kill me if I didn't, quote, talk, end quote. Four other cops surrounded me. Jello ordered me to strip. All five attacked me, punching and kicking. I collapsed and soon lost consciousness. I came to in a pool of urine. An animite cop brought in Lu San Han to mop the floor. They had already beaten him badly and he looked dazed. Then Gilat pushed me out of the room and down the hall. Stopping in front of the closed door of another room, he motioned me to look through the keyhole. To my horror, I saw a young man my own age, completely naked with his face battered. Quote, who's that? End quote, asked Jello. Quote, I don't know. End quote. Quote, you know very well who it is. End quote, he said threateningly. The prisoner I had glimpsed through the keyhole was No Chin Fen, a conrad whom I would later meet in prison. I was then placed in solitary confinement, completely naked, in a concrete cell. My clothes were hung outside on the iron hinges of the massive double padlocked door. My bed was a narrow inclined plank on the concrete floor. In one corner was the latrine hole, in the other a hole in the wall containing several liters of water. It was very hot. The stench of urine and excrement was suffocating. From a hole in the ceiling three meters above the floor, a dim ball behind a grate cast its pallid light on my new universe. It seemed like the antechamber of the first of the ten chambers of the Buddhist hell. My skin was damp and sticky. I tried to get some air by standing on tiptoe and pressing my nose against the tiny holes in the iron spy hole at the top of the floor. Excuse me, at the top of the door. Twice a day, the door would open just enough to pass in a bowl of poorly husked rice with a few scraps of dried fish, or sometimes beans and one or two strips of meat the size of a train ticket. <laughs> And at any other time, the sound of keys would make your heart skip a beat. It meant that you or someone in an adjoining cell would be dragged out for interrogation, in other words, to be tortured. I knew that it was usually in the evening or during the night that the su Surete, I think I was saying it wrong earlier, Surete political police took prisoners to the top floor into the rooms with all the doors and windows closed so the screams of the torture could not be heard out in the street. One evening my turn came. I was brought before the squinty-eyed cop. With him was Superintendent Peroche, a chief of the political police, who looked like a snake with spectacles. They stripped me and told me to, quote, confess, end quote. A hefty animite cop and notorious torture specialist, Chin Nock, attached my, thumb, attached my thumb to the bared end 
of a long of, a, of one long electric wire and my big toe to another. The two wires were hooked up to a huge truck generator mounted on a small table. The cop turned the crank, sending high voltage shocks through my body. I winced, leaped up, and shuddered involuntarily, then collapsed to the floor, my muscles twitching convulsively. This went on and on, dot, dot, dot. I don't know for how long. At one point, Parosh himself seized the cranks with his left hand. His right arm ended in an artificial white glove fist and turned it energetically. Then Chin Nock removed the wires. My thumb was scorched. He forced me to lie face down on the floor, his right foot pressing down on my lower back. Crossing my arms behind my back, he raised them towards my head. An atrocious pain shot through my fattened thorax. Then I suddenly blacked out, an instant in the void, in a dream of infinite peace and security. Then the shock of violent blows by a rattan cane on the soles of my feet brought me around, dazed and the half-conscious and stupefied to see all those pigs standing around me. The same dull pork eyes, the same cobra white spectacles, the infuriated mad dog mug spitting out threats and curses at me, as if I had defiled his ancestor's tomb. This form of torture was called, quote, gizzard twisting, end quote. My ravings apparently did not suffice for the required, quote, spontaneous confession, end quote. The cop kept me on my stomach, forced a cylindrical wedge of wood between my jaws, pushed it to the back of my mouth, and I tied it and tied it tightly behind my neck with a rope. He then bound my wrist to my ankles. My legs were bent behind my back. Then, as he pulled on the rope with one hand, he laid into me with the other, ferociously caning the soles of my feet. Every blow was followed by a short pause to let the pain sink in. During these pauses, he would prod me in the gut with a sharp end of a stick. I tried to cry out, but could barely whimper like a dying dog. My body arched, I kicked convulsively. I felt that my skull was exploding with each snap of the cane. The session was over. Now they forced me to jump up and down in place on my battered legs, so that the contusions would be reabsorbed to bring down the swelling and bruises on the soles of my feet. These torturers are experts in bursting prisoners' lungs, crushing their guts with inflicting atrocious suffering, while leaving little or no trace. I was taken back to my cell. In the wan light, uncertain days gave way to nights of anguish for me and for my companions in the neighboring cell, whose misery I suspected was equal to my own. We had all suddenly found ourselves thrust to the other side of life into a world apart, given over naked to bestial beings like those pictured in paintings of the Buddhist hell, with buffalo or horse heads, hawks beaks, and chicken claws. We knew the date of our capture, but we had no idea when or if we would ever escape their clutches. The big clock on the nearby cathedral struck each quarter hour, reminding me that I was there for an indefinite time. I tried to concentrate with all my might on the aged and respected Fan von Trong's advice when confronting our, quote, civilizers, end quote. Make it a principle to never fear another person, come what may. Make it a principle to never fear another person, come what may. One afternoon I was taken to an office where I found myself alone with a stocky Anamite man. He wore French-style clothes and had a very sincere and courteous expression. His large black briefcase was on the desk. He invited me to sit down facing him. Quote, my name is Le Van Kim. I'm a lawyer and I've been appointed to handle your defense, end quote. I felt I could trust him. In a low voice, I recounted all that I had endured during the interrogations. After being cut off from the world for an eternity, a week perhaps more, this unexpected, unhoped-for human contact meant that my link with the outside world was not entirely severed. After the lawyer's visit, I was transferred to the Surete Jail, alone in a gloomy, gray, narrow room without any openings except the door to the guard room. Yellowed cartons of, fl of, files, excuse me, of files were piled against the wall. I, at night, I explored them and discovered a comprehensive handwritten lexicon of Anamite communist terminology with French translations, including words and expressions newly introduced in underground communication since 1930. By what tortures had the enemy uncovered all these secrets? One afternoon, I was struck with anguish when I caught a fleeting glimpse of Ho Hu Tong, crossing the courtyard in handcuffs. He had been something of a secret advisor to us. At first contact, the guard called Tay did not seem cast in the same mold as the others. He looked calm, 
On his leather cigarette case, I noticed an unexpected motto traced in purple ink, Chi V Tong, quote, it's because I love, end quote. He met me out to relieve myself in the, lab in the lavatories, some lavatories across the courtyard. One morning, though, I saw his same, this same cop in a fit of anger, violently thrashing a prisoner with a broom and shouting curses at him. A few days later, we were taken to court and brought one by one before Tran Van Tai, a rat-faced judge with a puny mustache and cra flashy, crafty eyes behind spectacles set in a thick brown tortoise shell frame. Tran Van Tai's role was to sign warrants and entrust the surete with pretrial investigations. Prisoners brought before him who had been held by the suerte were excuse me, surete were invariably asked, quote, Do you abide by your confession? End quote. If the accused retracted their statements, the judge returned them to the interrogators until the quote, spontaneous confessions end quote, exhorted in the torture chambers were confirmed before him. The judge was animite, but he, was quest he questioned us in French. Those of us who understood that language could respond immediately. The others, instead of being questioned in animite, had to rely on an interpreter. As a result, from the judge's chamber to the courtroom, Anyone who didn't know French had no idea what all the magistrates, clerks, cops, and lawyers were plotting among themselves. Only when their deliberations were over did the all-powerful interpreter finally inform the prisoner whether he would be thrown into hell or freed or shortened by a head. The servile dispensers of justice, whatever their color and whether Anamites, Indians, or Martinicans, were often more pitiless than their white masters toward poor wretches who fell into their clutches. They have their lackeys snuff out... Excuse me, quote. This is like a poem, I guess. Oh, Victor Hugo. It's a Victor Hugo poem. Two lines only. They have their lackeys snuff out your troublesome flame. End, end of the quote. End of poem. Judge Tran Van Tai questioned me about my complaint of torture. Quote, Why would they have mistreated you if you were telling the truth, end quote, he said. One of the witnesses, a young French cop who had taken part in the beating in beating me up, interrupted, quote, We never mistreated him, end quote. I felt caught in a snare as I signed the papers the Anamite clerk had scribbled down at the judge's dictation. This net, a thousand invisible knots carefully woven of words of seemingly inconsequential sentences of innocent-looking phrases had you tightly bound and tied. The more you struggled, the tighter you were strangled in the meshes of their legal web. Signatures were appended, appended, quote, without other objection, end quote, at the bottom of these obscure documents, the case was closed. Then the judge told the policeman to keep us squatting in the hall and had us given pastries and hot coffee bought in town by the court attendant. Handcuffed by two by two and escorted to the same surete cops, we left the court by the side door opposite the central prison. This short crossing to the prison on the other side of the street and away from Surete's torture chambers seemed to us like the antechamber to release. Above the entrance to the Kam Lan, great prison compounds, surrounded by hideous gray walls bristling with glass shards was a gorgon's head with furrowed eyebrows jutting out over two black holes, a grimacing mouth and snakes framing its face. The heavy steel door opened with a muffled rumble just enough to shove us in, then banged shut behind us. Bars everywhere, the cops took off our handcuffs and the animator, animate warders in their khaki uniforms searched us under the watchful eye of the Corsican head guard. His pot belly wobbled under the white uniform. Sleeves adorned with enormous silver braids. In exchange for our civilian clothes, we were handed rash mats, excuse me, rush mats and clean prison uniforms. Common law prisoners, I later learned, were given use mat, used mats and uniforms that sometimes harbored itch mite scabbies and crabs in the seams. I received a shirt of rough dark blue cotton with wide sleeves dropping at my elbows and a front split halfway down, barely covering my navel in some knee-length trousers. I probably looked like one of those monkeys that animal handlers put on show in the village squares. I was given a 4 by 5 centimeter wood plaque, din by, bearing my four-digit prison number and the initials MAP, Maison de Eret Politique, Prison for Political Detainees. I attached the din by to a buttonhole by passing a piece of string through the hole on its top edge. 
We passed the death sentence cell. Next to the spy hole on the black iron door, we could see the identity, offenses, and date of sentencing of someone named Nay, an invisible man laying on a mat dirt behind the door, his feet held in Justice's shackles while he awaited illegal murder. A narrow staircase took us to the second floor, to the right where the cells were relatively comfortable with relatively comfortable beds reserved for French prisoners, Com Thai. To the left, cells 7, 6, and 5, all opening onto a narrow courtyard, girded by a wall half a man's height and topped by a steel fence. The guard put us in cell 7. About 20 men, some naked to the waist, others in the blue uniforms, gathered around us fraternally in the gloomy light. Once the iron door was shut, they helped us put our mats away. Old and new prisoners mingled, greeting each other like old friends with something approaching joy, but without asking any questions about identities or activities. There were about 25 of us and just enough room to move around without bumping into each other. We slept wrapped in our mats right on at the concrete floor, packed in rows like sardines. The walls were painted black up to a man's height. In one corner was a pitcher of water and the other a latrine hole. The back wall separating us from the outside was topped by thick steel sheets with air holes the size of a finger. These holes too high to be reached even by one prisoner standing on another's shoulders were our only source of daylight and air. By giving someone a leg up, you could observe through the narrow slit above the door the comings and goings of new prisoners and surete police. Our fellow prisoners were peasants from Duck Hoa, or Duck Ho, or Duck Hoa, H-O-A. Uh, arrested on May 6, 1936, by Anamite deputy administrator who had been be had beaten them into, quote, talking, end quote, before handing them over to the Surete political police. Nguyen Van Song, a hardy, well-built fellow, told us about his interrogation in the Rue Ketanat prison station, how under electroshock torture he tried in vain to keep from falling to the floor. He mimed a comical version of the scene, one bent leg with the other leg stretched forward, the big toe as though wired up to a generator, one arm stretched in front of him, the first closed and thumb sticking out, likewise wired up to the instrument of torture. I met Ho Hu Tong again. I had glimpsed him in the courtyard at the, su at the Surete. He had been arrested a week after Lu San Han and me in the halls of the courthouse as he was handling some matters with lawyers for our defense. Ironically, it was only there in that tightly closed and locked prison cell that we were finally able to come together in a group and talk freely with each other. Outside, with the constant fear of being followed, we only met in twos or at most threes in places we hoped were unknown to the police. Another advantage of prison was that we didn't have to worry about our daily rice. I was to experience the same exhilaration 20 years later in the sanatorium in the Pyrenees, where I spent a year free from the grind of the factory. So... For the time being, there were a dozen companions in struggle with opportunity to finally really get to know each other. It begin, to begin with, we were filled with joy with, by what Ho Hu Tong had, ta had to tell us. Two days later, our arrest, to me, two days after our arrest, during the night of June 12th to 13th, 1936, the League comrades who had escaped, it's like the League of International Commerce or something, whatever, the, it's a group that Vaughn was part of. Uh, two days after our arrest, during the night of June 12th to 13th, 1936, the League comrades who had escaped the dragnet handed out our leaflets in the city announcing that, quote, hundreds of thousands of workers in France have gone on strike and occupied their factories. Let's rise up in every factory, in every province, in every village. We should elect worker and peasant delegates and form action committees everywhere, dot, 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 end quote. Some of the leaflets were pasted on the newsroom wall of the Depeche de... Indochina, into China Dispatch, and the newspapers published the entire text in Anamite in its June thirteenth issue. Yeah, I need to move. I'm sitting. I'm in the sun now. I was in the shade before. Back in the shade. Ooh. I'm old. So when I bend over, I can... Ugh.
Uh, so, sorry. So, the widespread movement of strikes in factory occupations in France filled us with enthusiasm and convinced us to spread the spark with the hope of igniting the rebellious forces simmering under the surface among the workers and peasants of Indochina. Believing that the revolution had begun in France, we felt that the time had come for us colonized people to propagate it in our own countries. Every morning the door opened around 6.30 and we went out in the courtyard under the watchful eye of the Annamite warder. Two Cambodian common law prisoners clambered up the step, steep stairs until they reached out floor. Excuse me, they reached our floor, carrying water in a wooden barrel hung on a pool, pole across their shoulders. They filled our water jug and swept the floor. Around 8 o'clock, the head guard would appear, a veritable caricature of a colonial, th of colonial authority in his spruce white uniform, black sunglasses half hiding his face, and a cap jammed tight on his head. He was accompanied by a French guard clad in khaki with a big gun at his belt and by a barefoot, quote, jail boy, end quote, dressed in unbleached cotton, notebook and pencil in hand. We lined up on either side of the courtyard. The head guard advanced slowly down the lines without looking at anyone. At least we couldn't tell where he was looking from behind his mask. Next, he entered our, cell, our empty cell, peering into each corner. Then, as the same, so, at the same slow pace, the procession left the courtyard. At around 10 o'clock, common law prisoners, followed closely by the guards, assigned to prevent any communication with us, quote, politicals, end quote, brought us our meager meal, a tub of hunt husk rice, and a smaller tub of fish and boiled vegetables. Everyone was issued a tin, of, tin mug and a pair of bamboo chopsticks. Squatting on the ground in the courtyard around the tubs under the hot sun, we gulped down our rations. At the end of the meal, we had to return to our quarters and courtyard was washed down by the common law prisoners. We lined up inside, the old warder came to count us, and then the heavy iron door was closed. In the afternoon at around four o'clock, we were subjected to the same counting and the iron door shut again. With our peasant friends, we discussed how to organize our communal life. Sitting on the floor in a circle, we decided on a few rules and on the, sele on the election of a cell delegate. Preferably someone who could speak French. Since no one volunteered for the job, I was chosen, quote, unanimously, end quote, by my comrades. I was a little nervous about exactly what was expected of me and how I'd go about defending everyone alone against the warders. Do what must be done, come what may. Do what must be done, come what may. That afternoon, when our cell door opened, I was delegated to get us an additional jug of water. The old Anamite guard, polite and diplomatic but embarrassed by our demand, took me to the head guard. The blazing sun flooded the grassy courtyard. Around all sides, a veranda, bordered by yellow columns, screened the doors to the disciplinary cells. In the middle of the yard stood the ochre-colored watchtower. Crossing the courtyard, we headed toward Agostini, the head guard. All my comrades clinging to the courtyard fence followed us with their eyes to see what would happen. It was unusual for a prisoner to be taken to see the high guard, head guard. Agostini, astounded, found it t intolerable. Red with rage, he yelled, quote, Who allowed you to come here? End quote. It was, quote, it was, dot, 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 end quote. He cut me short. Forcing myself not to react, I waited, standing still against the wall facing his desk. He took a huge, dusty book down from the shelf and slapped it furiously onto his desk. Quote, Here are the prison rules. I will apply them. I'll have you all disemboweled by the guards. End quote. And he pointed a threatening finger, forefinger at the colonel, excuse me, at the colonial infantry quarters. I remained silent, not moving an inch. The maniac calmed down. Quote, what do they want? End quote. He asked the old warder. Quote, another jug of water, that's all. End quote. Quote, we'll see about, about that. End quote. He walked towards our quarters and we followed. We got our extra jug of water. After that, every morning when the head guard and his escort came around, I listed our needs such as aspirin or writing paper, which the jailboy wrote down in his notebook. The central prison, excuse me, new section, the central prison covering a whole block dominated the city center. The entrance was at 69 Rue Le Grandier. It was located opposite the Hall of quote, Justice, end quote, while to the left it was only separated from the Cochin China Governor's Palace by Rue Mac Mahon. It blocked off Rue de España, a busy commercial street. The right side of the prison was separated from the criminal record office laboratory by Rue Filippini, which ran parallel to McMahon. After, finally, the 
boundaries around this singular world were marked by massive gray walls twice the height of a man rigged ridged with glass shards and watchtowers on each of the three free corners a french colonial infantry soldier armed with a rifle stood guard day and night at night every quarter hour we would hear the cry quote sentry watch one sentry watch two unquote from inside the prison those of us on the upper floors could see the tops of the tamarind trees in the surrounding streets whose falling leaves told us another year had passed we calculated our remaining term of imprisonment in quote terramint seasons end quote after undergoing torture at the surete headquarters our young comrade von von kai began coughing up blood and losing weight before our eyes which made us very worried when he started hemorrhaging it was ta he was taken to the cho kwan hospital three days later he was brought back in worse condition than before in the hospital he first con received injections but because he struggled when they shaved his head the doctor had had him put in a straight jacket for 24 hours they then handcuffed his hands behind his back shackled his legs and sent him back to prison without any further medical care Taking care of him by turns, we tried to ease his pain using traditional methods of healing by rubbing and massage. From then on, we decided we would look after each other ourselves, and we taught each other how. One morning in early July at 10 o'clock, an animite warder came from Hu Ho Tong, Lu San Han, and me. We were descended, as we descended the sta our stairs, we wondered whether we were being taken to a session at the Surete headquarters. Two plain coast policemen were waiting for us in front of the head guard's office. Had other comrades fallen into their hands, and were we being taken for a confrontation? We were handcuffed and led across the street to the courthouse to see Judge Tran Van Tai. Because lawyers had lodged complaints about the torture and bad treatment we had allegedly received while held at the Surete headquarters, Tran Van Tai said he was going to have the Surete searched to find the torture instruments mentioned in our statements truck generator, rattan canes, gags, etc. Quote, now it's the Surete's turn to be searched, and quote, he snarled, smiling sardonically. Then he picked up the telephone and notified Surete political chief Peroche of the search. At that point, we understood that we had been assigned to the role of naive puppets in a shabby farce. Escorted by plainclothes cops, we set out for Rue Catanat in a covered truck, preceded by Tran Van Tai and his interpreter. My heart shrank as we mounted the stairs to the torture chamber on the top floor of that gruesome building with which we were all too familiar. As Tran Van Tai and Peroche entered the room, they motioned for us to stay outside. Suddenly, I felt someone hit me hard but discreetly in my lower back. I turned to find Jalo, our torturer. I didn't cry out. Was I afraid of retaliation? The sinister Tran Van Tai beckoned us into the room and with a sly smile asked us to point out the offending instruments. The cramped room was bare and unfurnished except for an old chair and a small table. The only thing left behind was the switch on the table that Jalo used to summon Ching Chin Nok, the Anamite torture specialist, and in the corner to the left, the small wash basin where the interrogators washed their hands after the torture sessions. There was no trace of the huge generator. My head swirled with visions of the atrocities I had suffered. I made, it made my flesh creep. We could breathe again only when we had returned to the central prison. That is the end of chapter one of part one of In the Crossfire, Adventures of a Vietnamese Revolutionary by No Vaughn. Part one was titled The In, In the Land of the Cracked Bell. And chapter one was titled Arrest. Thank you for listening. The next chapter is titled Childhood.